creative living. Utilizing today's technology with the best of the past to bring you innovative ideas and up-to-date information for creative lifestyles in today's active world. With your host, Cheryl Borden. Welcome to Creative Living today. We're going to learn how to use stamps on velvet fabric. We'll share some cabinet designs for a mudroom and learn to make a growth chart for our kids. One of my guests is Lisa Rojas, and she's a mixed media artist and designer from Victorville, California. Lisa is going to show how to make a beautiful velvet stamped photo book. Her business is Stamping Queen Creations. Another guest is Andy Wells, and he's with Master Brand Cabinets in Jasper, Indiana. Andy will talk about mudroom designs and explain how homeowners can make the most of their space. And we'll begin the show with Bruce Johnson, who is the spokesperson for Minwax in Upper Saddle River, New Jersey. And Bruce is going to show how to use an oversized wooden ruler to make a growth chart to mark the height milestones as your child grows. Bruce, thank you so much for being with us yeah. today. I was so excited when you said we were going to do a growth chart because I knew it had to be more stable than the giraffe I've still used on the back of my door <laughs> for all yeah. these years with right. my kids and grandkids. Oh, yeah. And, you know, Cheryl, I remember one time moving into a house, and the kitchen doorway had been where they had measured, measured. each of their kids. <laughs> and I, I felt bad painting over uh -huh. their names and the dates. It was history. Uh -huh. It was history. And when they moved, it couldn't go with them. No. And so I thought, wouldn't it be neat if you had something that you could take with you uh -huh. and something that was nice enough that you didn't have to have it on the back, back of the door? Back of the door, right. And so I came up with this, this idea great. of doing a in this case, a six-foot wooden mm -hmm. ruler. Uh -huh. And you can stand your kids or grandkids up against it, measure their heights, write the dates, yeah. and that sort of thing, and not have to, not lose it if you have to move. Oh, I love this idea. Yeah. And yeah. it's going to be simple enough we can all do it, Oh, right? we can. It's just a matter okay. of, of several, little, several little steps. Okay. Right. Now, I'm using poplar here. You could use poplar, pine, any wood you want. This is about 10 inches wide. I like the wider boards for that reason, going to give us room to write on. Oh, and for sure. For preparation, I'm just going to take some medium grit sandpaper. This is 150 grit, and I always give it a light sanding, mm -hmm. always going in the direction of the grain of the right. wood. So I've learned we, that through the years. We don't want any of those no. cross grain scratches. And then after that, I would wipe the dust off. And anytime you're dealing with any of these soft woods, they tend to turn blotchy when you oh. put a stain on them. And so to prevent that from happening, I'm going to use the pre-stained wood conditioner oh, that okay. you brush on. A conditioner. This is mm -hmm. conditioner. This is just getting it ready uh -huh. for when we put the stain on there. This is going to reduce that blotchiness. So you just brush that on. The wood grain's beautiful. It so does. we don't want to yeah. do no. anything to hurt that. No, and that's why we're not painting this too, because if you pay for the wood grain, mm -hmm. we want to see the wood grain. See it. Uh -huh. Yeah. Now that would need, uh, this is an oil based uh, wood conditioner made by Minwax. And so this would need 15 minutes to two hours to set up okay. before we'd stain it. And so, we'd do each of the sections. Yeah, we'd do mm -hmm. the whole board this right. way. I'm just doing one foot sections here mm -hmm. for us. Now, this board already has the conditioner on it. Mm. And so now it's ready for a stain and finish. Now, in this case, I'm going to use the poly shades, which is a combination of both the stain and the polyurethane oh. in one coat. And save I'll, steps. Oh, save, save time. steps, yeah. Uh -huh. And this is the pecan in a satin. That's beautiful, and, isn't it? Yeah, and again, notice we can still see. Mm -hmm. The grain of the wood coming right. through, but the pecan just gives it a little bit of extra color. Uh -huh. you know? And uh, and the critical thing when you're using the poly shades is just notice I'm just using the tips Tip of my mm -hmm. bristles, and just work it back and forth. Every I always now and then, wonder get a bristle what and pull it out. what tells you to use either a brush or those sponge brushes. Well, is the sponge rags, the sponge brushes like a rag, they're fine for oh. putting on a regular stain. But oh. anytime you're doing something with a finish, then you want to go to a bristle brush because oh, okay. it gives you more control. And as you can see, this gives us both our color and the polyurethane protection. Mm -hmm. Now, this isn't a, a product that we put it on, wipe it off. No, no, this, this is, is a little this bit different. This is what it's going to look like. That would be the two step where you put a stain on with a foam brush if you uh -huh. wanted to, and wipe, wipe it, it off. off let it dry, and then put your polyurethane uh -huh. on top. Oh, I the like poly this. poly shades mm -hmm. are, are both of them together, stain mm -hmm. and finish. So That's we set great. that aside. That's just our sample board. And this then would be what it would look like with our poly shades on there that's mm -hmm. now dry. Oh, so okay. as you can see, brings out the grain of, uh -huh. the, uh, of the poplar here. And what we're ready to do now is to take our tape measure and our pencil and our ruler, and you would go along with your tape measure and make your markings you know, every three and six inches mm -hmm. as you go down your board. Mm -hmm. And after you've done that, then it's going to look oh, like this. Okay. 
and you can see. And now what I've done is, and here you can do this any way you want it, I make my six inch uh -huh. markings, my hash marks, longer, longer. than the three inch uh -huh. ones. Just like on a real ruler. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's it. You're just really duplicating what a ruler uh -huh. looks like. And then what I'm going to do next is I'm going to take oh. my painter's tape because we want to make these stand out better than just a pencil mm -hmm. mark. I noticed yours were straight. They weren't curvy. <laughs> no. And that's where I credit the tape for this. Okay. And so you put the tape down mm -hmm. and press, you want to press those edges down because. So it doesn't seep under. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I'll take a little piece and put it across oh. here, just like so. Mm -hmm. And then it's just a matter of, now in this case, I want to apply a stain to that, a darker stain. I'm going to go to a gel stain. And oh. you know, these are, these have that thicker consistency. I like it because it doesn't run. No. That's... And it's perfect for what we're doing here. Oh, and now you're using the brush. I'm going to use the Sponge foam brush. brush. But you know what? We don't need very much stain when we're doing this. So I generally dab off the, the excess, excess stain uh -huh. there. And then oh. I just dab it on. I don't brush against the Oh, because you're going against grain anyway. Right. So yeah. I and see. I don't want it to go underneath mm. the tape. I just want it to go right on top, like mm. so. Uh -huh. And then we can set the gel stain aside and this. And the good thing is there's so many color choices with yeah. all these products yeah. that... Um, and then when you do your peel oh. off, you do your reveal, yeah. you can see that we're getting our, our hash mark there. Mm -hmm. Now, we'll set this one over there. Yeah. And this is what it would have looked like before we started doing right. the markings. And then that when you pulled it off, three, then. you can see it, uh -huh. the, how it would show up on there then. Look. And so it's a great way then to differentiate between them Okay. And we'll all right, set, set this one here. here. And then, okay. and then you know, as the final touch, you saw on our finished ruler, we yeah. did numbers. You know, those are really cute, and especially great, in the colors. Yeah, we've got uh -huh. different colors. So in a case like this, we're going to go to. We've been so far, we've been using the oil-based products, uh -huh. and now we're going to use the wood the, colors. Yeah, uh -huh. this is the uh, Minwax Express color. And this is an indigo. Mm. And what I'm going to do with this is, I'll take my number, and again, now we're going back to the foam brush. Mm -hmm. And we'll just start dabbing our number three oh, here. Oh, how fun. You can make it look, uh, coordinate with the children's bedspread oh, exactly. or yeah. whatever. And like you said, with, with lots of colors to choose from. And then we'll just... Yeah. Uh, and those dry that. so fast, too. That's the That's great thing about like. the water base. Water base uh -huh. gives you lots of choices of colors and gives you the, you know, the ability to do a project very quickly because mm -hmm. it's going to dry in just a matter of minutes. I remember so. when you first came and showed us about these colored stains. So mm -hmm. evidently they've done well because they've certainly been on the market Absolutely. a while. Absolutely. And like uh -huh. you said, it's nice when, when you take a look at your finished product that you've got your different numbers uh -huh. on there. And now you can either glue these on, you know, if you oh, put some woodworkers uh -huh. glue on there and put a clamp on there, Don't or you it. could, um, you know, you use a nail gun or a little brad and a hammer and attach them on there. Uh -huh. Doesn't make any difference. And wow. In the end then, like I say, in this case, we've got a six foot ruler. If you have a storage problem uh, and you don't want to have a six foot board in the house, you can actually cut it in half and hinge it on the back. And that's what you've done. I've been, uh -huh. On this one, I actually hinged it and you can't even see the hinges because uh -huh. they're on the back. That's so, a great idea. Yeah. And, it, and if you want to put it under the bed or in the closet, it doesn't take up so exactly. much room. And then, like I say, you can write the, uh, the names of each uh -huh. of the kids and the grandkids on there and the date. And it's a memento forever. It is. Well, yeah. that's a great idea. Thank you so much. I'll replace my giraffe now. <laughs> <laughs>
and, and if you don't put them in one place, then you spend a lot of time the next morning when you're ready to catch the bus or the parents are ready to head out. So I can see how they, the organization of a mudroom would, would come into play, but I always thought a mudroom was the same thing as the laundry room, but I can see it's really not. It, it, it really isn't. It can be part of that laundry uh -huh. room, but we look at the mudroom almost like a locker room where people may sit on a well-designed bench that has drawers beneath it to put shoes in or lunch pails. Mm -hmm. Mittens, it, gloves. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, coats. It's important in those mudrooms to have hanging hooks at the right height for the, uh -huh. the people that are there, whether they're oh. seven years old or grown-ups. Uh -huh. So it's again, it's purposeful design. So what would be the first step people would need to sit down and talk to you about if they wanted to put a mudroom in? Uh, it's very important to understand the use. Uh, every family household is different. It, even if it's just a couple living together, a mudroom can be very useful. If they have hobbies outdoors in the garden or if they have children when they're coming home from school, mm -hmm. each mudroom application can be very, very different. So in any design, it's really important to back away first, not talk about budget, talk about the purposeful design of that space and get the best use out of it. What elements are gonna be there? Is it coats, is it Wellington boots? Is it children's satchels, mm -hmm. umbrellas, walking sticks? What exactly is going to be in that space? See, and I would have thought that you, you would say you'd, sit, you'd talk to a designer and they'd start telling you this one costs this much, this one costs this much. But we do want it to be functional, which is what you're talking about. Yeah. But we still want it stylish. We don't yeah. want it to be the room that you don't want anyone to ever see. We want it to be um, personally designed too. I always talk to consumers about what they need, not their price point. It's really important to understand where they live, what their mood is, what they do, where they work, before we even put pen to paper or even talk about budget, and then get into what do you want to do with this room? What, what are your hopes and aspirations for it? Mm -hmm. After all, that's what we're selling is aspiration. Aspiration. But if someone doesn't already have a mudroom yeah. to remodel, at what point do you or a designer go out to the actual home and then try to carve out some space for a mudroom? Once we've done a, a site visit, it's very easy to see how to place mudroom facilities in a building. Mm -hmm. They're not always obvious until you do a field measurement and go into a space. Folks might think that a space is just good for a laundry room. Mm -hmm. Well, appliances have changed. We know that washers and dryers have got taller and bigger. They have. Most of them now are like in Europe, front loading. Oftentimes people can't afford to change those. So we, we might start off disguising the old appliances tastefully and realize the space in that laundry room to create a nook that can be classified as the mudroom. Mm -hmm. But if you can't, uh, you mentioned that a mudroom could be somewhere, it could be anywhere into the house, in, in, the, in the existing house. But uh, I, I guess it's hard for me to understand how, how you would carve that room out if you didn't put it in the laundry room. Right. Um, out of bedrooms, out of a hall, of a front entry? How do you find some of these secret locations? Well, if we look at the front door of a house, occasionally you may have a hallway or a vestibule mm -hmm. where you may have four feet of wall space. Oh. It's a great place to, to create a low bench with maybe some wainscot paneling and some mirrors and some hooks and a hat rack in a very, very small space. So it doesn't have to have that wall and door. No. I was trying to think, how would you put a mudroom by the front door? So it can yeah. be a part of the decoration of the entry. Yeah, and it doesn't necessarily have mm -hmm. to have the name mudroom. If it's mudroom, it kind of implies that you're coming in from That's the outside, from mm -hmm. the farm or from the garage. Uh -huh. It could be in the garage. It could be in the entryway from the garage. But oh. certainly in hallways, receptions, vestibules, I'd say it's on the lower level of a building, mm -hmm. but uh, usually where people are coming in. Okay, I hadn't thought about that. Just make because again, we do want it stylish. I was thinking sure. about hiding it off somewhere where no one would see oh, it. No. Uh, what are some other things that a person might consider putting in a mudroom if their dream came true and they got to design just the perfect one? Well, the, the perfect mudroom is a place where you can put your coats and your hats. Mm -hmm. It's a place where you can keep your your house slippers and exchange them for your outdoor shoes. It's a place where your your umbrellas might be stood in a, a taller cabinet. We have many, many different shapes and sizes and styles uh -huh. that can be designed around a person's use. And as I was mentioning earlier, it's all about really understanding what the consumer's needs uh -huh. are. And we've really switched gears at Master Brand about understanding first. What, what are you doing? People might be going out trap shooting. 
Oh. Now they might have a deer stalker hat uh -huh. and a walking stick or uh -huh. a shooting stick. Or golf stick. clubs. Golf that clubs, take up exactly. A lot of room. Uh -huh. Tennis rackets, uh -huh. sports equipment. Those are the kind of things that we can design the cabinets around in, in that space. Mm -hmm. And so if a, if a person's home is already decorated in, let's say, lighter colors, would you tend to go opposite in a mudroom? Or again, is it just personal like? Do you do dark colors nat naturally? Um, tending more towards dark with the mudroom, unless it's a very small confined space where you need oh. more light. Uh -huh. Light is always a very important consideration in any room of the house. Uh -huh. But um, we have so many different paint finishes, wood tones, that we can usually design a mudroom space that is harmonious with the rest of the house. I think house. that would be the key. Yeah, we don't uh -huh. want it to stand out and people say, well, what is this space uh -huh. supposed to be saying? <laughs> uh -huh. So we tend to, tend to design it so it keeps um, cohesiveness with the rest of the building. Is, is a mudroom a feature that would, like a kitchen and a bathroom, be a real selling point when you got ready to sell your home? It's, it's probably third on the list. Is it? The kitchen uh -huh. is a, the top selling uh -huh. point if you've remodeled and made it current. And then, of course, bathrooms are more and more important every year. And the mudroom is kind of, and mudroom and laundry room together are really kind of new features that we're seeing in houses. So I think if you can find a space where you might put a, a little mudroom slash locker area, then it is another key selling that's, point. That's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then transitional versus traditional decorating or choosing of cabinetry, how does that work in? Transitional is a word that's been around in our industry for about 10 years. Um, we were a very traditional industry, but what we talk about now is designing door styles and finishes that are transitional in nature. Oh. So we're not dictating and saying, oh, this is colonial, mm -hmm. or this is federal, or this has to be date stamped. We're trying to make sure that when consumers are buying our products, that we don't date stamp and say, okay, Cheryl, you bought it this year. Uh -huh. Five years from now, it's out of date. Right. We want to give it some life so mm -hmm. that the, con the customer feels really confident about what they're buying. I see. That certainly makes sense. And again, it, it allows you to flow from one room to the other. There may or may not be a door on it, which I, it was the idea I had in mind. Right, exactly. And the word flow is important in any building. Years ago, we'd talk about the ergonomic triangle in a room. Uh -huh. It, it applies somewhat today, but our uses in our kitchens, bathrooms, and mudrooms, laundry rooms are very, very different mm -hmm. to just 10 years ago. Well, and we're lucky to have so many beautiful choices, beautiful finishes to choose from, as well as all the great appliances that we yeah. can take advantage of. Well, we have lots of finish and color choice, and being in a fashion uh -huh. business, as we call it, we have to stay current on trend so that we've got the right offers that are harmonious with paint selections, mm -hmm. with flooring, with tile, with window treatments, and indeed wallpaper. So we don't design in isolation. Uh -huh. Well, and I thought such a, uh, an important point that you made earlier when we were talking was the fact that we no longer hide things. We're back to nature. We're, we're Absolutely. showing the, the, the beauty of the wood itself. We're not trying to cover everything up and disguise it. It's really one of our key strategies is to be authentic with our offer uh -huh. so that we have a story behind everything that we're making down to the design of the cabinet doors to the finish itself. That's so interesting. I wish we had longer. Thank I you so, so much, too. Andy. You're welcome. Lisa, thank you so much for being here today. And when you come, I always know we're going to learn something new about stamping because you love to stamp. Yes. And make all kinds of things. But yes. I thought probably it was limited to um, craft products and, you know, paper and that, but it's not, is it? <laughs> no. No, this is a whole other stamping area. You're uh -huh. still, I'm still using my stamps, so I'm still in love with my stamps, but I'm just using it in a different medium. Uh huh. Well, and the medium is velvet. Is using velvet. Using it to, yes. uh, on velvet. I it's thought been, that was the velvet stamping has been around for quite some time. Has it? Mm -hmm. Uh huh. And you talked about that it needs to be a certain type of velvet. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I learned very early on is if you don't buy the rayon acetate, you're not going to get a good impression. Okay. This, the, this, this is the rayon acetate. This is the rayon acetate, yes. And this is the stamp. People will be able to see it a little more. I don't know that I can even show it enough to see, but there's a, a beautiful floral stamp pattern on here, and you're going to show us how to do that. Yes. Okay. And this is what, this is a cheaper, a cheaper velvet. 
And this is the velvet that you do not want to use do because not. if you look at it, I can't even see you the can't see the impression exactly. And on this, you can really see how yes. it looks. Okay. So you want you want rayon the rayon acetate. acetate because it's got a, a thicker uh, plush. You know the fibers are plush, uh -huh. so okay. it makes it a lot nicer to stamp on, and it's very easy to do. And that's what this is. This is that's rayon what this acetate. Is. Yep. And yeah, what you do thicker. is I give it a give it a little squirt. Now there's, you know, everybody has their own technique or way uh -huh. of doing things. Um, a lot of times people will say, you know, if you're going to velvet stamp, lay your stamp down, put your fabric oh, on fabric top. Oh. Okay, that's a great way to do it. But for me, I like to spray it with my water first, uh -huh. and then I put my stamp down this way, and then I pick it up and hold it. Oh. Like this, so then I can see where it exactly doesn't matter on your first one, but uh -huh. when you're adding when you're adding more and more detail, you want to make sure that you don't run into things. So you take your iron. It's you just a dry iron. It's a dry uh -huh. iron. You, you want to make sure it. that um, if it has holes to avoid the holes completely uh -huh. or use an iron that doesn't have holes. Oh, I just noticed that. Uh -huh. yes. There's no steam holes. No, nope, so. no steam and holes. And you don't want those. And then what you do again is just give it a quick little spritz. Squirt. Uh -huh. and then lay it down, and then you hold it in place for about three to five seconds. seconds. Mm -hmm. Don't rock it, and don't rub it. No, okay. You just want to go down and up. Okay. Straight down, and then straight up. Like when you adhere and, uh, fusible, you don't yes. want to iron it. You're just putting it down and yes, holding it. Yes, because if you're doing this on it, you're going to rub, uh -huh. you're going to rub your design, and then, then you're not going to have a clear design. So then when you're done, oh my gosh, this is what you pretty. get. Oh, I hope we can show that because that is just beautiful on there. Oh, I, yeah, we can see it now. Can you see it? Uh -huh, and we couldn't even see anything on the on the green, you yeah. can tell. Uh -huh. it's, it's the total difference in the uh -huh. velvet. You really need to have the rayon acetate. It's so you would put as many or as few. It could just be one or it could be mm -hmm. a whole pattern. In fact, and this again, one. And again, if you're, if you're, a little nervous about working with fabric like I used to be, stamp your pattern out on a piece of paper first and then you can use that as a guide. Get your design. Get your design out. out on a piece uh -huh. of paper and then just go ahead and, and do it with your velvet. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And since the other one was already embellished, this one we can see exactly how many of the the stamps that you pressed on and that yes. they're kind of in a row. Yes, and very then, pretty. Yeah, and then all you do is you take your velvet. Mm -hmm. And you glue it on. I use uh, Beacon Adhesives, their fabric tack glue. Glue it on the back. Uh -huh. And then you glue it on your album front, like this. And then let's look at all the different and embellishments you that you put on it. just start adding your embellishments. This is the really fun part, isn't yes. it? Yes, yes. And this comes like this? This comes like uh -huh. this, yes. You can buy it like this out of the store. Uh -huh. The only thing that... Um, that you know you need to do at home is the saying. I did it on a computer, you sure. know, with a computer uh -huh. font, and then I just added the frame on top of it. Oh, I see. And I just used my fabric, fabric tack, and I just glued everything on, uh -huh. and you just you have it's a beautiful, beautiful gift. And what a nice way to use up. You know, sometimes we'll have one flower left, or we'll have two leaves left, or something yes. like that, yes. or just a piece of this, which is just perfect for something like this project. Well, yeah. thank you so much for showing. I never thought about stamping fabric, especially velvet. On um, velvet, yep. It's, well, it's really beautiful. Thank you, Lisa. You're welcome. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed the show today. Next time on Creative Living, we'll learn how to prepare canapes. We'll find out how easy it is to make some fashion embellishments and room decor. And we'll talk about some design tricks to reshape your room size. One of my next guests teaches culinary art. And he and one of his students will demonstrate how to make canapes. And whether you call them canapes or appetizers, my guest believes they should reflect the overall mood of the meal. Another guest is a licensed designer, and she'll show how to create a variety of easy and fun fashion embellishments and room decor projects using some of her shape cutters from her collection. We'll also show a wide variety of new materials to add extra bling. And finally, we'll talk to an interior designer who's going to explain the tools you can use to change how you perceive the shape of a room's interior. She'll also discuss lighting, pattern, and color in a room's interior and explain how they should all work together. 
All of these topics will be featured on the next Creative Living Show. If you ever have comments or suggestions or ideas for shows, you can email me at cheryl.borden at enmu.edu. I'd also like to ask you to become a fan of Creative Living on Facebook. Just go to facebook.com and in the search window, type in Creative Living with Cheryl Borden. Thanks so much, and I hope you'll plan to join me next time for Creative Living. We are very pleased to offer you a new booklet that accompanies this series of Creative Living. This booklet is titled the 6900 series, and it features a wonderful collection of ideas and information, and it's available free of charge on our website. Posted as a PDF file, you can simply download the entire booklet or just the segments you're most interested in. For your copy of this new booklet, go to our website at kenw.org and then click on Creative Living. Scroll down to the booklet section and you can click on this booklet or on any of the other booklets that we have available online. We also would like to invite you to sign up for our free e-newsletter. Just go to kenw.org and click on the Sign Up Now button. Thank you.